Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning meditation class. We've been having a class. I've been teaching uh, Sunday mornings this time since I think around 2000, so been quite a while. And uh, the class, I'm Hugh Byrne, by the way, and, and I'm a teacher with the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, IMCW, founded by Tara Brock back in the mid-90s. And I've been involved in with IMCW since 2003. And uh, some of you may know, but if you don't, I'll, I'll do a little um, ad advertisement that um, IMCW has bought a retreat center down in Madison, Virginia, wonderful Seven Oaks Center, just uh, half an hour north of uh, Charlottesville. And uh, many of us have been going down there for, you know, past, you know, 20 years and more. And I've taught down there a few times. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful place. And I was actually down there yesterday with a group of volunteers, about 40 or 50 people, um, helping, you know, get the place in shape for, you know, the retreats starting again. Um, actually, at the end of this month, I'm going to be co-teaching <clears throat> A retreat down there, a week long, six day retreat down there. So, um, if you're ever looking for a retreat, not just you know IMCW, but other people will be offering retreats down there. It's a it's a great a, a great thing that's happening because you know at least in that in our <coughs> excuse me in our um, DC area, greater DC area, it's uh, it's always been a challenge to find places for retreats that are. You know, comfortable, but also financially not not out of the you know range for most people. So the class is offered by IMCW, and within IMCW we have a very vibrant community, as many of you know, the Center for Mindful Living, which uh, has existed since around 2011, I think, and uh, and um, particularly with when we had a center in uh, Northwest DC in Tenley Town. And then when COVID hit, um, everything went online. And in a way, um, everything really blossomed there. We weren't able to offer in person courses or classes, but, uh, you know, many, many offerings online, meditations, um, cl you know, uh, t classes, uh, you know, um, different different classes and different sangha led offerings. So um, it's a it's a very welcoming community. If you're not part of the Center for Mindful Living (CML), and um, you know, very much invite you to uh, to participate in the other offerings of uh, of, uh, of the center and and obviously of IMCW as well. Um, so uh, it's a lot, it's great to um, great to be here. Um, with everyone. Um, we, um, just in terms of the, uh, the format of the class, we normally begin with a, uh, with a, a meditation, words, some words of welcome, and then a meditation. And then um, Emily uh, will normally lead us in, in uh, some mindful movement, and then we'll have a, a talk, normally around 30 or 35 minutes. I don't know, if, is Emily here um, with us today? I'm not sure. Anyway, we'll, we'll see, and if, if not, we'll, uh, we'll just go into the meditation. And uh, so a very, uh, I'm just going to go into gallery view here. There we go. Nicer to see all, all, all the faces, not just, uh, not just my own. So there we go. So just in, um, before we get into the, go into the, the, the formal meditation, uh, just a couple of words about, um, about the practice as, Many of you have been meditating a long time and, you know, different instructions that different teachers give, um, you know, I mean, they're all pointing in the same direction, but kind of with somewhat different emphases. But it's a couple of things that I would emphasize um, in, in relation to, you know, mindfulness meditation, insight meditation, is uh, just the importance of one's attitude 
you know, as we, as we practice. You know, in a way, I see attitude as perhaps kind of, I don't necessarily want to kind of hi- make a hierarchy, but it, I mean, it's re- really quite fundamental the way we meet our experience. You know, we could focus on a lot of different things. We could focus on the body, we focus on the breath, we could focus on sound, we could kind of focus on whatever comes and goes. And in a way, it's not so important what we focus on. Um, but the way we focus is is really important. You know, if you come with a kind of an agenda of I've got to do this right or I've got to be perfect, I've got to become a great meditator, that's probably going to be a big obstacle <laughs> to really being present for our experience. But if we can come with an attitude of um, of openness, of acceptance, of kindness to ourselves, you know, compassion, um, and really open to whatever is arising in the body and the heart and the mind. And, you know, see everything as just part of the, you know, in a way, part of the passing show. Important, but in a way, in a way, not the most essential thing. You know, the, because the situations will change, you know, whatever's coming up in our meditation or in our lives, you know, things will come and things will go and we get pulled into certain things and we'll not like other things. And, um, you know, that's just kind of part of life. But uh, but the, the real freedom that comes in meditation is to kind of be aware of the passing, you know, phenomena, everything coming and going and all being impermanent and being able to really find peace within within everything. So it's, I find it really helpful just to cultivate an attitude of acceptance of whatever is coming, you know, just opening to it, allowing it to be here, you know, letting it come, letting it go in its own time. You know, we I often come back to Rumi's poem, The Guest House, you know, of welcoming the guests. You know, whatever's coming up, can it just be a guest that's coming? And, you know, we don't have to try and hold on to certain guests and push away other guests, but just kind of let them do their thing for, you know, the time they're present and then let them pass when they're when they're ready to pass. Um, uh, you know, with a, with a non-controlling attitude, it's when we're not trying to make anything happen, but rather to... Just be aware of what is naturally arising. You know, yes, we can certainly direct our attention in different ways, and that's very valuable. But not to, you know, you know, not n- not to have it be a really kind of a, a goal oriented. I've got to get somewhere. You know, obviously we have a direction we want to go in, and we have our intentions, but not not to kind of. I've got to get this particular state. You know, I don't. I I need to be calm. Well. You know, sometimes we'll get, become calm and that can be very helpful, but not really to have that as the end of the practice. It's much more about the relationship than about a particular experience. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there just as a, a you know, kind of a little bit of a framework for our, for our practice. We just invite you to find a, a posture that's co- uh, comfortable, relaxed, no sitting with your back straight. No helping create conditions that will allow you to be as present as you can be for this this period of time. So obviously, it doesn't help to be in a kind of a contracted or tight tight posture. So just finding a posture that's comfortable for you. And if you if you like, if you're comfortable, you can let your eyes close and let your attention go inward. You know, we spend a lot of time in our minds, in our thoughts, in the past and in the future and elsewhere. It can be helpful just to let the attention come into the body. Just feel your body, feel the contact with the surface beneath you. Feel the sensations of warmth or coolness, whatever 
feelings you notice in the body. Just with a, an open, accepting attitude of towards whatever is here. And it can be helpful, you know, particularly at the beginning of a meditation, to take a, one or two or a few longer, deeper breaths just to help you settle and arrive. You know, again, if that's helpful to you, you know, take a nice full deep in-breath, filling the chest, filling the lungs. And then releasing on the out breath. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. Letting the breath settle into its natural rhythm or whenever you're whenever you're comfortable doing that. And it's helpful to remember that the breath can be a very helpful resource, you know, if you find yourself feeling tight or aversive or disconnected, you know, just to come back, come back to the breath, maybe take a deeper breath or two and settle, relax, begin again. can also be helpful at the beginning of a meditation to you know, what the Buddha called gladden the mind. And it brings some happiness or some joy into the mind, the heart. You know, I find a very helpful way to do this is just to reflect on something or a few things in your life that you feel grateful for. We can so easily just focus on what's wrong or what's difficult and forget about all the things that we have, all the gifts that life has given us. You know, whatever it might be, it could be, you know, friends, loved ones, family, pet. the beauty of nature, the trees, the birds, the animals, sun and the moon and the stars. You might Reflect on your spiritual practice, you know, the role that the life of the spirit plays in your in your life.
can also be helpful to invite a smile to your face or a half smile, enough to activate the muscles around your eyes and around your mouth. You might think of someone or something that makes you feel happy, joyful. And just take in whatever feelings come up for you. When we gladden the mind, we just create the conditions for uh, for openness to to life, appreciation, connection, you know, suffering. When we suffer, we, inevitably we get into an illusion that we're alone. You know, we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders just to be able to come back and remember, you know, remember our connection with others, our connection with life. And we're really creating a foundation to meet whatever comes up with with acceptance and with kindness. Just being aware of your experience, your bodily feelings. See if you can make space for whatever is here. There might be some tightness or some discomfort in some area of the body. See if you can just let your attention come to that area and just let the sensations come go. You might notice, just bring awareness to whatever mood might be prevalent right now, whatever emotions might be present. Sometimes it might be you know, some heaviness or some tiredness or restlessness. See if you can just be aware of feelings that come with that, without resisting them, without pushing them away, just allowing whatever is here to be here, just making space for what's present.
you might notice the mind, particularly the thoughts that might come up, might be coming up. Just see them as another expression of, you know, conditions of life. You know, maybe habits. We might have a particular kind of thought that we tend to gravitate back to, maybe worry about something or aversion to something. Just see if you can just let, know, be aware of the thought. And let it come and go. So choosing not to fuel the thoughts. But just be aware of them. Letting them come and letting them be. Letting them go. See if you can invite an attitude of acceptance to whatever is present. Poet Dorothy Hunt says, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. Peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. So really we can choose peace in any moment by bringing acceptance to what is here. Stepping out of whatever story might be in our mind of, I don't like this, I don't want this, want something else. If you can, as Rumi says, welcome the guests. Choose to say yes to what is here. You could think of it as just stepping back to the awareness of whatever the content is, of resistance or aversion or wanting, whatever is here, just coming back to the awareness. You might notice that the awareness is not itself annoyed or clinging or craving. Rather, it's aware of whatever the content is.
Eckhart Tolle says, anything unconscious dissolves when you shine the light of consciousness on it. Anything unconscious dissolves when you shine the light of consciousness on it. So if you're caught up in anything, you're caught up in, I don't like this, I don't want this. Just be aware of that feeling of aversion or annoyance or whatever it is. And once it's seen, you can step out of the story. You know, it can come and go, it can pass. It's really only our clinging that keeps it going, you know, keeps the story going. Just of shining the light of consciousness on whatever is here. We'll finish with this poem by Thich Nhat Hanh, For Warmth. I hold my face between my hands. No, I'm not crying. I hold my face in my two hands to keep the loneliness warm. Two hands protecting, two hands nourishing, two hands preventing my soul from leaving me in anger. So take your time coming back into the group, opening your eyes if they're closed. And so welcome everyone and welcome anyone who joined us uh, during the meditation. Um, and, uh, you know, if you please feel free if you'd like to, if anything comes up for you, or if, you know, anything you experience that you'd like to share with everyone from, you know, maybe coming out of the meditation or, you know, when we when I share the talk, um, you know, any thoughts, any questions that come up, please feel free to use the, uh, the chat, the comments, and, uh, and be able to kind of address and share anything you, you put in there. And, uh, good to see you, Sam. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So the, the theme for, for today um, I want to talk about is um, begin really with a, you know, the metaphor. You might, have, might be familiar with this metaphor of the, um, you know, just as um, it said that, um, you know, said in Buddhism that, to really experience freedom, you need to practice both wisdom, you know, that's the kind of clear seeing, insight, awareness, um, that's, you know, focused on a lot of, uh, in, the, in the teachings. But we also need the, the, uh, the practices of compassion, you know, practices of the heart, practices of loving kindness, compassion to others, compassion to ourselves, joy, equanimity, really the heart practices more broadly. 
And it's, it's said that just as a bird needs two wings to fly, uh, for our, in our practice, we need these two wings of wisdom, the wing of wisdom and the wing of compassion. And um, I want to kind of illustrate this and the importance of this teaching uh, about you know, wisdom and compassion, the need for, for both in our practice. Um, you know, you could say that, you know, without... Without wisdom, compassion can be, um, you know, can lack boundaries. We can get overwhelmed with, with others' suffering. You know, obviously we want to care about others, but if we take on others' suffering, you know, and like, oh, that's a, you know, we take on it on as, as though it were our own, then it's going to be overwhelming to us. We need, you know, we need to know where somebody's, You could say where, where some, somebody, somebody's suffering is their own, we can care about it, but without, you know, without taking it on. And when, when, when we need to say, okay, this is, you know, each one of us is responsible for our own actions, for our own lives. So we need to, we need to have wisdom to, to kind of the, to have that balance there. Um, but wisdom without compassion can be, can be harsh. It could be like um, un uncaring. Um, we really need these these two wings, you know, just you know, to to, to fly on. <clears throat> and what I want to do today, <clears throat> excuse me, is to focus on um, a story. Um, it's a story in the Buddha's teachings that um, has. I think of you know is is very very directly linked to the Buddha's own life and life experience. As you probably know, there's a lot of kind of legends around you know the Buddha's life that are clearly, I, I would say clearly, <laughs> I don't know, but appear very much to be kind of additions. You know that things that are added to help people kind of understand the teachings or you know. Kind of connect with the teachings, um, and maybe I'll, 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 I'll mention some in in the in the talk generally. Um, but there are some, you know, if you read the original original Bud Buddhist teachings, most of us will read that. If we do, we'll read it in translation. But there's wonderful translations. But the, um, you know, it becomes clear that certain certain um, things that are shared in those teachings come very much from you know from the buddha's own life and real experience and the story i'm going to um, focus on today is one that for me just really rings true in in every way you know rather than being a kind of a nice story or maybe having a grain of truth and then it's built into something kind of much much maybe more complex um and i want to um talk about um the the Buddha's, um, particularly the Buddha's search for the end of suffering that led to his awakening. And I, I just want to kind of put that in the context of, you know, the overall story of, of the Buddha's life. And I'm going to do that in very, you know, in very brief terms. Some of you may know this story fairly well. <clears throat> and uh, I, want, I want to highlight really one, one moment in this story <clears throat> that I think, <clears throat> excuse me, one, one kind of moment in the story that has, that is a very powerful one and one that, ring, um, that links very closely to this, this kind of teaching about the two wings of the bird. And it's a story that maybe doesn't in the kind of more, you know, the way the Buddha's story has gone out into the larger world is maybe not so well known. It's kind of known mainly among people who are, you know, fairly experienced practitioners, maybe have heard talks, you know, a certain number of talks, I've been on retreats, etc. Um, but the more I've kind of reflected on this story, the more important it is to the whole essence of the Buddha's teachings. So with that, I'm just going to say, you know, 
probably all of us have heard the outline at least of the, the Buddha's story that, you know, it seems pretty clear that, you know, he was born, you know, his name was Siddhartha Gotama. Siddhartha was his given name. Gotama was his family name. He was born into, you know, a, a, um, a, a noble, wealthy family. Um, and there's lots of stories in the discourses, in the suttas, as they're called, um, about his life. You know, he talked about, you know, having everything he could possibly want. You know, he had luxuries and comforts and people to minister to his every need. He speaks about having three different palaces, one for each of the main seasons there in that region of northern northern India, Nepal, that kind of um, region where, where he lived, grew up, and ultimately did his search and then did his teaching for 45 years. And, you know, the story is that, um, that he, um, the kind of various levels of complexity about the story, but the kind of legendary piece one thinks of as, I, I think of as that is that his father, um, you know, wants, has, uh, there's somebody who comes along after he's a, a wise person comes along and, you know, gives a, a, a kind of a, a, a reading, to, you know, and says, you know, your son is e either going to follow you in the, in your, you know, in your, um, you know, in your life as a, in, in your, um, as a, as a, a great, a great ruler, or the other possibility is he's going to become a great spiritual teacher. This is kind of more in the kind of legendary part of the story. And so the Buddha's, um, or Siddhartha, as he was, then, then was his story, the story is he, he wants to keep, you know, Siddhartha from, from seeing the dark side of life. And, you know, so he only sees the wonderful, comfortable, lovely things, you know, everything seems, you know, seems wonderful. But in the story, um, he, he goes out, in outside of the, the palace outside into the wider world and really sees the world of suffering and three things that he sees are you know really have an impact on him he sees a sick person he sick, sees an aging person and he sees somebody who's died you know it being kind of emblem emblematic of sickness aging and death that will happen to all of us and that this is a kind of a, a light bulb going off and kind of I, you know, just I, this is going to happen to me. And even though I've got everything and comfort and luxury, this is going to happen to me. And how am I going to deal with that? And, you know, is there is there a greater freedom that's possible, you know, in the midst of this, you know, life that I wasn't really aware of, sickness, aging and death? Um, and then those three, these three visions, as it were, three appar appearances, apparition, apparitions. And then he sees a fourth one, which is of a wandering mendicant, a wandering, you know, monk, you know, person um, who doesn't have anything except their begging bowl and the robes that they go in. But the, this uh, wandering, you know, men a mendicant, we could say, is a... a um, has a very, very calm, relaxed, you know, very, very uh, peaceful countenance. And that kind of in the story gives him a, an encouragement to kind of, okay, that maybe is the path to, to freedom, the path to the end of suffering. So in the story, you know, that's kind of more the, I think, the legendary story. But what comes to me is of somebody who has everything they need need in life but realizes there's something deeper that they may not you know that, that they need to understand and so how, what you know is part very much not the legend but the, you know very much part of the story i think is accurate historical story is that he decides to leave his home and become a wandering you know uh you know a, a, a wandering um monastic or a kind of living living the homeless life and he's he's married at this stage he's got a child um and uh but he he leaves his family he leaves his life of comfort and luxury and 
you know, there's not a lot of talk, and I, this kind of relates to what I'm the talk today. There's not a lot of talk about, you know, feeling, oh, my, my, what's my wife going to do? What my kid going to do? All of that. Um, it's very much of, you know, a story about d determination. You know, sometimes people come and ask questions about, you know, but yeah, but why did he do this? He left his, well, you know, he left, you know, a kind of idea of him as a, you know, a deadbeat dad. You know, a kind of, a kind of thing. Um, and and at that stage, you know, he wasn't the Buddha. He wasn't the awakened one. But uh, it re very much relates to what I'm going to talk about in a minute. But so what he does is he leaves. He he takes off his robes and all his luxury things and you know, presumably you know, jewelry or whatever, and 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 puts on the the robes of a a, a wandering kind of monk. Um, uh, cuts his hair, shaves his beard, and, uh, you know, goes out into the homeless life. You know, that's a very key step that he takes. And in the, in the teachings, um, you know, it's said, you know, told that he, he looks for who, who, who might have something to teach him, you know, about, you know, the question that he has, is there an end to suffering? Is there something that that's beyond sickness, aging and death? And so, he studies where he hears about, you know, leading teachers of his time. And he studies with two of the main, main teachers in that area, you know, Alara Kalama and Utaka Ramaputa. Um, and uh, in each case, you know, he, he, he masters everything they have to teach. He's actually offered leadership of each of these, these kind of these teaching groups or sects. Um, but he realizes that he he's he hasn't uh, he hasn't answered the question. You know, he may have developed deep meditation techniques, but he hadn't found the end to suffering. So again, there's this kind of determination. He said, "No, I, I don't want to lead the groups. I want I want to continue my search." So it's very strong determination. And then um, the next kind of direction he goes in, he you know, a lot of people at the time and. In, in, in the, today as well in, you know, India and the subcontinent, a lot of people are engaged in or were engaged in ascetic practices, you know, uh, practices of uh, austerity. You know, some some would just go round, you know, just on their hands and knees, you know, that was, you know, and, and others would, you know, go out with very little clothing on in the heat of the day and the cold of the night. And there's kind of the it was like the idea that if you could punish the body enough, then that would be a way of freeing the spirit. And it's kind of in many different traditions, you get that, you know, in different traditions, you get, you know, in earlier, I don't know, in Christianity, and I think in Islam, the, you know, the kind of flagellations or certain branches of, you know, different religious traditions, um, you know, kind of flagellation, you know, Going around in well, sackcloth and ashes is more a pe penance thing. But going, you know, but but you know, the idea being that the body is in somewhat, you know, somewhat is problematical. It's something we need to get beyond. And if we can, you know, if we can, if we, in a way, it's almost like punishing the body in order to free the spirit, in order to, you know, to awaken. You know, one might say, "Good luck with that." You know, I'm not sure that how many times that's happened, but I, but but Siddhartha, you know, in his determination, he sees that maybe this is the road, and and what he he does is he you know goes through various practices, and what's what makes it very interesting is you know if you read this is the and if you. You can't see this clearly. This is one of the main um, books of the Buddha's teachings, the original teachings, the, the suttas, the discourses called the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the middle length discourses. And there's really a, quite a few pages describing some of these. I'm not going to read very much of them, but I'll give you a few, you know, uh, little vignettes from it. Uh, uh, um, but he would, he would do these punishing of the body things he would one of the things he did and there goes a couple of pages on this of how he would he would actually try to stop breathing you know and and just kind of be present with whatever you know comes up and 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 he's able to do this you know i mean up to a certain point but um 
uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't lead to the, uh, you could say it doesn't lead to the end of suffering, you know, it doesn't lead to wisdom or insight. And then he, he, he tries, you know, another fairly common thing, which is a kind of star, a starvation, you know, close to, you know, really starving the body or almost, you know, and in his case, actually, almost to the point of, um, you know, of, of death, he, he, he speaks, he says, suppose I take very little food, a handful of soup, um, pea soup or lentil soup. And this is the kind of the discipline he gets into of, of just living on very, very, very little. And over time doing this, he, you know, his body becomes really emaci emaciated. Um, he, he, he actually says, in, it says, um, he says, because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jointed segments of vine stems or bamboo stems. Because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof. Um, because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads. And this goes on. And, and, and because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. You know, so there was no space between his stomach, really, and his back. You know, he was really was skin and bones. Um, you know, I won't go into some of it. It's kind of very graphic. You know, it's kind of like this he was he was very very seriously into into this and it, uh, and and he said he asks himself and he's in the middle of this you know kind of this these practices and he asks himself um he says other people when they've done this other recluses recluses and brahmins um no one's done this more than i have right now you know in this than i than i have um, no one's gone beyond this. But then he asks a really important question, he says, or, or statement, he said, but by this wrecking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. It, what he's saying is that he hasn't, he hasn't gained insight, he hasn't t gained true clarity insight awareness that is freeing he hasn't that that this hasn't had the the effect that he wants it to he thinks that punishing the body is going to lead to some awakening but then he, he's done this to this extreme you know where he you know by the description he's kind of close to death's door um and then he, but he has the insight to kind of look at that and say oh have I gained anything from this? Have I seen anything? Have I gained any clarity? And he answers honestly, he says, no, I haven't. And then he asks a question, he says, could there be another path to enlightenment? Could there be another path to enlightenment? And then this is kind of the, the really kind of heart of the story. He says, I, I thought about this and he said, I recalled that when my father, the Sakyan, that was his kind of the, the group, you know, the community was, his father led. When my father was occupied, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, quite secluded from sensual pleasure. So he wasn't, you know, wasn't getting, this wasn't coming from, you know, eating, eating huge meals or getting high or drunk or anything, secluded from unwholesome states. So he wasn't doing anything like, you know, that was, you know, you, you kind of things were like exciting or sexual or, you know, food or drink or anything like this. It was just an internal state. And he says, I entered into and goes into deep states of awareness and absorption where he was calm, his mind was really focused, and it was filled with, with what he says, with rapture and ple pleasure for born of seclusion. So he was experienced a deep joy. And these are states that, you know, that can, can arise in meditation, where when the mind is really calm and settled, where there's a deep, a deep peace, deep happiness, joy, and different states can come up. Um, but they're not dependent on, you know, 
something happening, something external happening. They're, they're really internal. They come from, they come out of the conditions of quieting the mind and just being present and being just that calm, letting go of all hindrances and, you know, distractions and all of that. And then he asks himself, um, he said, could, could this be the path to enlightenment? You know, could the, this, this joy, happiness, pleasure, but not pleasures of the senses, but really this deep internal pleasure and joy, could this be the path to enlightenment? So he's kind of doing a, a kind of self-inquiry. He's asked the question, you know, is, could, you know, is there another path to enlightenment? And then it, when this memory says, could this be the path to enlightenment? That is, um, pleasure that's non-sensual, you know, that's not like based on, oh, this is a nice taste, or this is a nice feeling, or this is a nice sound, or a nice vision, or whatever. But, but internal, internal, non-sensual pleasures, not tied to unwholesome states, particularly not tied to craving or clinging or aversion. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, an inner peace, an inner joy. And, and, and then he says, yes, this, this, this is the path. I think this is the path to, to awakening. But then he thinks, he, he reflects, he says, it's not easy to attain that pleasure with a body that's so excessively emaciated. So, you know, by being, you know, continuing, obviously continuing these austere ascetic practices, that's not going to be the way, way to awakening. Um, and he, and, and actually that's going to be an obstacle to awakening. So he says, suppose I ate some solid food, some boiled rice and bread. And just as a little bit of background, he'd been practicing these really intense, austere practices with five fellow ascetics, five fellow people on the path, on this path of austerity. And they're all thinking, you know, all believe that if they punish the body enough, then that will, they'll be able to uh, uh, attain an enlightenment or awakening. And then he, he so so when he, um, when Siddhartha um, decides to take the you know food um, rice bread etc and get healthy, they see that and they say you know how people would you know that, that he's fallen off the wagon you know he's he's left the true way as they see it and he's become you know he's become a um, as they said. Gotama now lives luxuriously <laughs> because he's taking a bowl of a bowl of porridge or rice. Um, he's given up his striving and reverted to luxury. You know, so they they dismiss him and they you know he, he, he's he's a waste of time basically. But but Siddhartha, you know, has realised that this that that path of austerity isn't the way to freedom. That memory from the, his childhood is kind of what spurs him to say, okay, to really question and say, okay, maybe there's another way. And that's really this insight that he comes to, that, that this kind of punishing the body isn't the way to enlightenment, that, um, that look, actually taking care of the body. So what he does is he gets well, gets healthy. I mean, it, they don't say how long this takes, but you probably don't go from death's door to, you know, sitting under the Bodhi tree and waking up in, you know, in a day. Probably this is over a period of kind of maybe a number of days and weeks. You know, they don't go into the detail, into de detail about that. But then when he, when he's got healthy and regained his strength, he then you know that that's when he sits under the tree. You know the tree uh, where he, uh, the awakening. You know that ex the experience of awakening occurs. And under the tree, you know, twenty six hundred years ago in what is today the village of Bodhgaya, in uh, in the province of Bihar in 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 India. He currently that's uh, what it is. Um, he he experiences that the awakening. He gains. 
clarity and insight. And one of the central, perhaps the central insight um, that he uh, that he gains, or um, you know, through that, through through meditation and through opening to his experience is into the Four Noble Truths about suffering and the end of suffering. That basically, that when we cling, we suffer. When we let go of clinging, we let, we let go of suffering. And that there's a skillful path to the end of suffering, the noble eightfold path, you know, the eightfold path to the end of suffering. And these, this is kind of a central realization. And from there, the Buddha, you know, again, over presumably over some days and weeks, you know, it kind of takes in the, you know, the depth of his realization, the depth of his understanding that, you know, is so profound that there's no possibility of suffering arising in him again, that the clarity, the insight is goes so deep. It's the seeing, seeing into the truth goes so deep that there's no possibility of, you know, after a while, kind of deviating back into, oh, I need this, I want this, I don't like this, all of that. That's all ended. And then, you know, he, he goes, he begins his life of sharing the Dharma, sharing his understanding with people from all walks of life for 45 years around that area of northern India, um, the Ganges Plain. You know, he goes, his first teaching, he, wa- he walks, it's a couple of hundred kilometers from um, Bodhgaya to uh, Varanasi on the Ganges, which is was was called Benares, and he goes to where he knew his um, ascetic um, comrades had been practicing. And when they first see him, they're kind of uh, there he is. But they see something in him has really changed. You know, there's something something has really really changed in him. He's kind of presents in a whole different way, and they they kind of reluctantly sit down and listen to him. And he teaches his first teaching on the Four Noble Truths. You know, the sutra is called the the turning of the wheel of the Dharma. It's kind of when this new Dharma, this new new teaching comes into the world. And it's come down to us, you know, these teachings kind of still resonating. I think of it as like a bell that was rung almost 2,600 years ago and the kind of the the re- re- reverberations are still with us today it's you know, very and you know, i feel kind of very v- moved by that uh, these these teachings but what i want to share about this really the kind of the 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 lesson for it um for me and i think for for me, for others as well is that as i see it what siddhartha brought to his search was a was a real sense of determination, um, you know, when he leave, he determines to leave home, you know, and kind of embark on this very hard path. He didn't know where it was going to be, didn't have any backup or cushion for himself, but he was just going to go into the homeless life and see what came up. Real sense of determination in that, real sense of determination when he's offered the leadership of these, these groups meditation communities and saying, no, that I haven't yet found the end of suffering. So again, he kind of continues, he keeps going. So that sense of determination, kind of a single mindedness is very, very strong. When he enters the path of austerity, clearly, if you read these suttas, he's like, there's a sense of like, I'm going to get there. (laughs) You know, it has a kind of, you know, it has a, this fierceness to it. But what clearly isn't present or is v- not very clear at all there is any sen- any strong sense of compassion, any strong sense of bringing in the heart. It's very, very, in a way, very one-dimensional. And he realizes that when he, when he remembers this story of being under the rose apple tree. It's this you know, he's got the determination. There's no question about that. But that doesn't take him where he needs to go. It doesn't take him to awakening without bringing in the heart. And it's really only when he, when he, bring, when he has this memory, 
again it's under a tree both of these both this memory of, of from childhood sitting under the rose apple tree and then the the tree of awakening under you know in bodh gaya it's only by that real through that realization that um that we that we need to take care of ourselves one that self-compassion is essential you know there was no self-compassion in punishing the body and starving the body you know the 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 body was seen almost as like an enemy you know very very dualistic isn't it you know free the mind by punishing the body you know and and you can't go come to oneness through you know through that kind of duality you know the duality is separates us from the truth so it's it's bringing in this understanding of kind of incorporating it like oh i need to take care of this body and actually taking care of the body looking after you know looking after this body um bringing in kindness you know firstly to himself and then really incorporating it and understanding the importance of compassion of loving kindness of these wholesome qualities which are very pleasant but they're not dependent not dependent on getting things or having things so qualities like joy um like tranquility like a a concentrated mind like a like equanimity all these qualities um you know all of those i mentioned are far, part of what are called the seven factors of awakening they're 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 qualities that actually help us on the path to awakening so the 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 buddha the buddha's path up to really that that realization is really one wing of the bird you know one wing of the bird is very strong the determination the insight it's a very you could see it in a you know in a you know masculine feminine in terms of the energies not gender per se but the energies it's a very masculine kind of energy of like you know of 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 the of the kind of the doing thing and and bringing in bringing in the heart um is is kind of bringing in the the other wing of the bird and both of these are essential to uh to awakening and and really um the teachings a siddhartha couldn't have awakened without um without this uh bringing in the heart bringing in compassion bringing in bringing in kindness bringing in joy you know wholesome joy joy not dependent not the joy of eating 10 cheeseburgers um but but the joy of uh, you know the that that kind of inner joy that doesn't depend on conditions doesn't depend on having anything kind of external but is just that that the joy of you know that comes out of life that that this this is was essential to to siddhartha's awakening and becoming the buddha the, the the word buddha is linked you know same cognate cognate with our um our word for bud you know a bud flowering is the buddha the 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 buddha awakening it's flowering to the full potential you know his full potential as a human being and teaching how we can um uh, awaken to our full full potential in this human life the the greatest possibilities the deepest possibilities of this human life um can come come with awakening come through this clear seeing um but that needs the two that needs the two wings of the bird needs wisdom needs insight but also needs compassion and kindness and and so his teachings when he does teach then are grounded in both both wings of the bird you know imagine that somehow he was able to awaken without the compassion 
you know, people would probably be <laughs> wandering around, you know, not eating, living on one grain of rice a day. But, but you know, it wouldn't be a path to awakening. And I don't think it, I, I, I doubt that it has been a, a, a genuine path of, uh, of awakening. I mean, you never know people's inner life, but it doesn't seem a, a, a wise a wise path to awakening. Um, and so the, um, I'm just going to finish off the talk with um, um, a quote from uh, Joanna Macy. Um, I know if everyone knows, uh, Joanna Macy is a wonderful uh, Buddhist meditation, you know, Dharma teacher. I think she's around 90 now, um, you know, and she's, uh, uh, life has been deeply uh, rooted in, um, you know, in, in Buddhist teachings, but also in the, you know, the bringing the teachings into the world, particularly into the world of, of the environment, ecology, um, our relationship to all of life. Um, you know, she's a, just a wonderful teacher. And she t speaks about these two wings of the, of the bird. She says, we need both of them, compassion and insight, or so, compassion and insight into the radical interdependence of all phenomena. One isn't enough. We need the compassion because that openness to the pain of the world provides the fuel to move you out where you need to be to do what you need to do. Yet compassion by itself without understanding and trusting our inter interconnectedness can burn you out. So you need the other wing, the wisdom that knows how interwoven we are in the web of life, inseparable from each other. That wisdom reminds us that we're not involved in a battle between good guys and bad guys. For the line between good and evil runs through the landscape of every human heart. Kind of it's within each of us, that, that, that struggle of the reality of, of good and evil. It teaches that we are so interconnected and inter-existing that even the smallest act with clear intention, has repercussions throughout the web of life. But wisdom by itself is not enough to move us forward for the sake of all beings. It needs the steady, heart-opening beat of compassion. Then we fly. So these two wings of the bird, we need... So I think it's very, very important for us to look at our own practice and bear in mind these two teachings, you know, am I balancing these teachings? You know, at certain times, you know, the, 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 the kind of the strength of determination may be, you know, what we're emphasizing. Other times it might be more emphasizing the heart practices, self-compassion, compassion, loving kindness. But overall on our journey, we really need to bring these practices together. We need to you know, fly on the two wings. So I think coming back to our own practice and say, you know, what, 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 how does it feel? How does it feel in my body? How does it feel in my heart? How does it feel in my mind? Does it feel like I'm, I'm over striving? Does it feel like I'm, I'm not taking care of myself or my heart feels closed, etc. So, Let's uh, let's pause. Leave it here. Um, I hope that you know there's some useful reflections in in this to you know help you in in your own practice. And we've got some time now to uh, to um, to hear from folks, and uh, we, we'll do that um, both. You know, I invite you to share in the in the chat, and also if you'd like to to raise your your hand and and uh, actually speak, um, Luciana. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your kind words, Luciana. And Debbie Sue, the title of the book is uh, "The Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha." Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha in uh, Pali is called the Majjhima Nikaya. And it's translated by uh, Bhikkhu Nyanamoli and Bhikkhu Bodhi. And then, you know, if you if you really want want to get into it, you get into this doorstopper, which is the long discourses of the Buddha. I don't know if that comes up here. Yeah, there we go. The long discourses. 
uh, the Diga Nikaya. Anyway, there's a number of of, of these uh, books of the the Buddha's teachings, and and it's great to great to read them in you know d- direct translations from the original teachings that have been passed down through twenty six hundred years. You know, um, Pamela says uh, today's session has touched me deeply to the core. Thank you. I'm able to soak in and rest, be at peace, and grow. Shazi and Sangha family, bless you all. Peace and love. Thank you, Pamela. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And um, let's see. Anyone? um, Thank you, Terry. Thank you. I'm glad it's helped deepen your understanding of this journey and lessons. Thank you very much, Terry. And anyone like to um, raise a question, share your own experience? Stretch. I don't. I don't see Emily here. No. Don't. Um, you know what we could do. While 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 you're thinking of things to share, um, maybe just um, invite you to uh, just stand up and do. I won't go through the whole of the routine, but just come in. Maybe just do a few stretches. Come into the body. been sitting for quite a while you know whatever helps you feel less we get any kinks and tension out rolling the shoulders giving the arms and nice stretch yeah just whenever you're ready just coming back and uh Um, Hisham, good to uh, good to see you. Please uh, please share whatever you'd like to share. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I just have a question about uh, the wisdom part of the two wings, um, and we have been told that the power of Buddhism is that you you have to explore for yourself what works for you. And over time, people become their own therapist by understanding and trying to to go deeper into the layers of their habitual mind. However, when you get into the fourth noble truth, it's pretty descriptive on how to get into freedom. Uh, Like the right speed, the right concentration, um, the right view, it's pretty details to the extent that does it makes me feel while I bought into the uh, the essence of Buddhism that empower the mind, but I feel when I get into the fourth noble f- truth that it's that not much different than Islam, Buddhism, Christianity in many ways. So uh, it's it's a it's a pause of reflection. I'm not making any statement. Uh, yeah. I'm just thinking loud. It's a, yeah, thank you. That's really very, a really important point to make. And, um, I, you know, I think it's a, a lot is about how we how we approach it and how we meet it. Um, I would say, you know, very, very much say that they're not intended in any way to be like, you know, like the Ten Commandments, say, for example, you know, you you should do this, you should love your neighbor. You know, those are all great things to do, but they come, you know, they're, they're, sh- they're shared and they're put out there as, I mean, it's not a coincidence, they're called commandments. <laughs> they're not called the 10 invitations, <laughs> you know. It's kind of like you do this, you know, if you want to if you want to go to heaven or whatever, you know, you do this. You know, you love your, you love God, you love your mother and father, you know, all that. Um, and I'm not, not trying to criticize those either, but, you know, but they are very much that. And these are not that, as you pointed out, Hisham, and they're, they're not intended to be commands. They you know, they're intended to be guidelines. And so when you talk about, you know, wise speech, wise intention, wise action, wise, you know, wise, wise understanding, you know, the, the, the eight elements of the path, wise mindfulness, etc. Um, what I think the most helpful way to see them is as a framework, as guidelines, 
not as not as orders, not as commands, because as you say, and as the book and the teachings really emphasize, they really emphasize this see for yourself. So it's really holding this is kind of wisdom and compassion as well. It's holding that, you know, the, the teachings that a the Buddha has something helpful for us to look at if we're open enough to do so. You know, like definitely an encouragement, take a look at this. This could be very helpful. And certainly I found it enormously, enormously helpful in my own life. You know, just the understanding of the Four Noble Truths is like a, so certainly for me, it's a game changer. Oh, clinging. You know, I'm doing something here that helps perpetuate my suffering. And, oh, I can actually let go of it. Not that it's easy, but, and then the, the Eightfold Path is like, okay, the more we cultivate this, the more we cultivate kind of wise understanding, wise intention, the way living a life that where we're not out killing people and robbing banks, you know, and, and, you know, doing harmful things, which is going to obviously affect our minds, apart from doing a lot of harm, um, that, that these are really guidelines. And if we can hold them as guidelines, and then see for ourselves, then that's, that's kind of where the awakening comes. Because if you do t treat them as like, something like commandments, they won't be very, they won't be, they won't be helpful. They might kind of point you in the right direction, but we need to make them our own. We need, the awakening has to come, come from us. You know, even the Buddha can only point the way, you know, I come back to this a lot. I tr share this a lot. The, any teacher can only point you towards the truth. Each one of us have to find, has to find that truth ourselves. This is kind of taking refuge in awakening in the Buddha is to not so much to take refuge in the historical Buddha, you know, who awakened. Yes, you know, obviously, you know, revere the Buddha, but not to, you know, it's not about the, you know, it's not about, you know, seeing it in others. It's having that shine the light on the possibility of us awakening ourselves. So what I would emphasize, Hisham, is, is kind of that balance, because if you can hold the, eight, the Noble Eightfold Path as, as a framework, as pointers, as invitations, as encouragement, then, then you can explore it in a way that's much more open-hearted and in a way open-ended as well of like, okay, what happens when I cultivate wise understanding or or cultivate wise speech or action how does it what what happens do i does it help me see things cl more clearly does it incline my mind towards happiness towards joy towards awakening i don't know hisham is that does that kind of respond to your um to your question because i think it's it's a really important one and um uh either Oh, maybe we lost to show. Anyway, um, I hope I hope that's uh, that's how. Um, what I will, I'm, I'm just noticing. I don't want to uh, take us longer than uh, our time today. Um, uh, Shazi, do you want to share just a few words about the uh, CML and um, things? Um, I, I will. I will share two things. Um, but you can do that, and then I'll share if you're up for it, Shazi. Sure. Thanks, Hugh, and thanks, everybody. And I just posted the um, donation, the Donna information, and <clears throat> here's the CML calendar. Many of you guys know that we have Hugh is through IMCW, the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, and our kind of sub-sangha, which is a center for mindful living. So I hope you'll check out both calendars. Um, and CML for local folks. Also, we have a Google group and a newsletter. And this coming Saturday, a friend of ours from the Sangha is hosting a music uh, series at the Do No Harm Farm up in Germantown. And so we're going to kind of hopefully gather a bunch of local folks to meet up there. So if you are not on the Google group and would like to be, please pop your um, email and I'll add you. And if you have any other questions about CML or anything, uh, thank you. Thanks, Jesse. And... Um 
I'm going to I'm going to share one other thing here. There we go. Good. Um, yeah. As, as uh, thanks for sharing all that. And uh, you know, just as we say each each time, um, these free these teachings are freely offered, and uh, the practice of dana or generosity is how they how the teachings have come down through twenty six hundred years. So appreciate your your generosity uh, any anything um, your support in uh, helping me to continue teaching